Hello there, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, gamers of all kinds. Welcome to Fun and Games. Uh, my name is Jeff. And my name is Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon. And uh, welcome to the pilot episode of our show. Um, to get things started, I thought it would be fun for the listeners to get to know us a little better and for me and Jeff to get to know each other a little better in our gaming history. We would interview each other about the kinds of games we've played, what we're into, what we like, um, the kind of show we want this to be. Um, and I think a great place to start is our knowledge of gaming and why we're into it and what we're into. Um, I guess the first thing I would want to ask you, Jeff, is what's the first video game console you ever owned? Um, well, I was born in 1986, so uh -huh. I think my first console is what a lot of people my age, their first console was the Nintendo Entertainment System. See, and it's funny, only being born three years earlier, mine was the Atari 2600, which was an, a hand-me-down from my brother who got a brand new Nintendo. And then about a year later, and my constant bitching and moaning, my parents then also bought me a Nintendo Entertainment System. But I used to play games like Mousetrap and Pac-Man while my brother was playing Super Mario Brothers. I was very cranky about it. You were able to have two Nintendos? Well, because my brother didn't share anything, and we were nine years apart, so yes, we were able to have two Nintendos. My brother didn't share anything either. He had the NES in his room. I just had to get his permission to go and play it. Uh, that happened years later when my brother had a PlayStation, uh, an original PlayStation. I had bought the game, uh, the N64, and so I would sneak into his room uh, when he was off out with friends and play his PlayStation with games I rented. All right. Well, actually, that kind of leads me into an interesting question. So you you would say that the NES that your parents bought for you, that is the first video game system you grew up with that you could call yours. Yes. Yeah, that was definitely the first one that I owned, that I picked out all the games for, that my brother never played. I think my first one was actually the Sega Game Gear. Oh, nice. Uh, given that the NES was in my brother's room, it was, you know, there were games even for it that were more mine than his, mm -hmm. but it still was very much on an older brother's whim. And actually, now that I think about it, he was probably, he's, he's about your age. So it was only like <laughs> a, a three year gap kind of things. And so the Game Gear, it was a handheld system. Mm -hmm. It was mine. I had the bag for it. I had all the little accessories and things. And so, yeah. Every game that I had in my library, every game that was a Game Gear game in my home was one that I chose and one that I chose to play. And it's, a, it's kind of funny. That, well, naturally, it's a handheld system. So, yeah, it can be closely identified to a singular person. Sure. I mean, also, though, it was a handheld system that weighed, like, the amount of two bricks at least. It, was, it required six batteries that it ate in maybe an hour and a half. Um, but I also had a Game Gear as well, which was the first handheld system I bought. Then quickly realizing that was a mistake because the Nintendo Game Boy had better games. So then I ended up buying, when the color came out, an older Game Boy off a friend of mine. All right. Well, it's funny. I never experienced the battery problems of the Game Gear. Oh, wow. Because I remember this uh, quite vividly. Uh, the Game Gear was a birthday present for me. It was my eighth birthday. Mm -hmm. And my parents got me, basically for my birthday, was a whole Game Gear setup. Oh. I unwrapped all kinds of boxes and things that my family did. still does this to this day. They'll put fake presents inside nicer boxes <laughs> or vice versa. The amount of beautiful things I've pulled out of Rice Krispies boxes <laughs> is at this point innumerable. But so I would unwrap... Um, the, the carrying case, uh -huh. and in it was some goofy thing my mom made. Uh, and it was the Sega Powerback, which was the thing that was nearly the same size as the Game Gear itself, sure. but screwed into the back, plugged in, and was essentially uh, an extra battery pack. Oh, nice. And so you got about 10 hours of gaming out of it. Wow. And it had a switch that allowed you to charge it long or quick. Oh, uh, wow. If you did it long, it took about... Uh, six to eight hours of plugged in time to fully charge, but you could play it while it was on. If you put it to short, you couldn't turn the system on, but it would only take about two hours. Gotcha. And so that was that was my fight back and forth. And I didn't realize what a Game Gear felt like in your hands without that glorious monstrosity on it uh -huh. uh, for years and years. You know, it came with that. It came with a couple of games. came with all this stuff. And then even the, the box itself. Uh, all of this stuff, and there's nothing in it. And I had a couple of games. Now, those naturally had the games in there. I got Sonic 2 and Mortal Kombat 2. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't have the game gear. My father had turned it on, pulled out. He's like, well, then just you can borrow mine. <laughs> um, it, it, it's a very uh, 
It's a very formative experience, and I'm sure you could extrapolate a lot from it. This is not a psychology show. No, it's definitely not. Um, well, since we both own, owned Game Gears, um, I'm curious, and since we both own Nintendo, let's go back to the Nintendo first. If you had to pick one game to be your favorite Nintendo game of all time. Crystalis. Oh, wow. You had that one ready and prepared. It absolutely is. This was a game that, um, for those who don't know, Crystalis or Crystalis, um, I've never heard it properly pronounced. <laughs> uh, it, spell the word crystal, add I-S to the end. That's the title. Um, I believe in, J- in Japan it was called Legend of the God Slayer. Wow. And that sort of name plays out great in America, so I don't oh, know sure. why they renamed it. <laughs> right, yeah. But uh, Crystalis plays somewhat like um, if SNK decided to make Legend of Zelda. Oh, interesting. It is a top-down action RPG game where you collect different swords of different elements. You are an amnesiac hero in a post-apocalyptic world where magic has been rediscovered in the world. You get different um, quest items, usable items, armor and shields, and the instruction manual for this game was uh, one of those like 64-page colored, um, listed out all of the different items that you could get, descriptions, and for a kid who couldn't get very far in the game on his own, uh, getting to see these items going like, I cannot wait until I can get the Psycho armor, which was the best armor in the game. Mm-hmm. It made you immune to all of the conditions that could happen. Poison, paralysis, uh, Neeper, which was being turned into a little monster uh, that couldn't do anything. All of this stuff. And it healed your hit points when you stood still. Oh, wow. This was the best thing right? when I was a kid. And I never got it until I'm an adult and game facts and all right, that. Of course. Um, but I still have my original copy of the instruction manual. It is war-torn. I could pull it out right now. I'll show it to you after the show and so when time came for me to rebuild my uh my video game collection which is something that we both need to talk about a little later um chrysalis was the top of my list it is a game that i will go back to time and time again uh the music stays with me the the feelings that it gave me as a kid it's one of those games that i loved as a child i idolized so much and it holds up in every respect Awesome. So let me turn the question back to you. What is, if you had to pick your absolute favorite NES title, what would it be? Um, I mean, that's really hard for me because I liked a lot of the classic NES, like, known for being on NES console Na- games. Naturally. But I think my favorite, still one of my favorite gaming si- series of all time is probably Mega Man, the original Mega Man series. And Mega Man 2, 3, and 4 hold a special place in my heart because growing up I played all three of them all the time. Um, Gemini Man is still one of my favorite themes from Mega Man. Um, I've looked up endless amounts of remixes of that song on Um, Mm Overclock.com. But if I had to pick one favorite Mega Man game, it would probably be the second one. It's one of those games that I can still beat easily on my own, handily finish, and get up to the space alien form of Wily before getting my ass kicked. Um, (laughs) But uh, it also has my favorite Mega Man boss robot of, of all time which is metal man who is a metal ninja who threw giant fan blades of metal um but i think that that game is probably one of my favorites because i played it so much growing up and because um i hated the first one so much because the first one was so unbeatably hard that um i would probably you know have thrown my nintendo out the window had i not also owned the second one which was way easier way more manageable but still not a cakewalk and and uh, quickly became my favorite of the mega man titles well i definitely feel um there are a number of games out there where you go the second one is the one you start with the first one's good they had some good ideas but they really hit their sh- mega man is one of those series yeah. the the original i've gone back to it i've played it it's it's good it's yeah. a good game, and you can see where the series could go. Yeah. But Mega Man 2 is some and something beautiful. And uh, my experiences with Mega Man are something similar. I, um, I grew up with Mega Man 3 and Mega Man 4 mm-hmm. as the ones in my house. And so it was funny. There was the one with the Mega Buster and the one without. Yeah. Uh, Mega Man 3, I definitely agree, had some of the best tracks. Yeah. Uh, Mega Man 2 is beautiful, amazing stuff. But Mega Man 3 sticks with me in so many ways. Um. I, I would say Shadow Man was probably my favorite theme from it. That's a good one. Another just... He was kind of the Metal Man of yeah, Mega Man He was 3. a ninja who he, threw he giant was, throwing stars. He was the actual ninja. Metal yeah. Man was the like weird doctor-looking thing, metal-throwing ninja. Yeah. But uh, both were 
both are a lot of fun in their way. Well, Mega Man 3 also introduced my favorite character, one of my favorite video game characters of all time, which is Proto Man. Proto Man. And I, I, I always adored him, mostly, like, I think it was my tiny child brain went, he's got a scarf and sunglasses, that must mean he's cool. Because there was no other reason to like him, because there, and his, my favorite color is red, and he was red. But beyond that, like, they didn't, there was no backstory really for him yet. And so you just looked at him and went, oh, I guess he's cool. I guess I like him now. They gave him a theme song. They gave him they an did. intro whistle that if That's you true. paused, you'd hear more of it. Yeah. And I certainly didn't pause the game yeah. to listen to that ad nauseum. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, I want to uh, shift the conversation while still talking about Nintendo and starting at our roots. If you have a least favorite Nintendo game of all time, because mine is easily on deck, which is the first Ninja Turtles game for Nintendo. Um, anyone who's played that game knows that the bomb dam level is the hardest <laughs> level in the history of gaming. It was something that I, I, never saw, I, ne I never saw beat until I was an adult. And when the worst part was, so I was never able to beat that level as an adult, and, until I was an adult, and even then, a friend of mine got up to the Technodrome, got up to Shredder, paused the game, and said, I'm done. I'm like, what do you mean you're done? You're at the final boss. He's like, yeah, but I can never beat Shredder. Someone else do it. And then, of course, we all died and got a game over anyway. But it's like, it was just one of the hardest, most ridiculous games I ever played based on the Image Comics version of the Ninja Turtles. It was insane how difficult that game was. It absolutely was. I, um... I liked that game, and <laughs> it's funny. I actually used to get through the dam when I was a kid. Oh, I yeah. never get past the next area. I'd, I'd drive around with a party wagon, oh, and yeah. I'd like I, I don't know. I'd goof off and never figure out what to do next. But as an adult, I don't think I've ever beaten the dam, which I suppose <laughs> says something. I could probably sharpen the skills and everything else, right. but I've never put the time in. Um, probably my least favorite NES game is Star Voyager. <sighs> Star Voyager, if... I mean, there can be a lot said, and I have plenty to say, about um, a game's conveyance and its ability <laughs> to show you what to do. Um, a contrast between what is said in the instruction manual versus what is found on screen. You know, sort of a fun idea of, and especially in retro games these days and in collecting yeah. games, while you can find great scans of instruction manuals, while you can find all sorts of great things said, there is still plenty of times... And I ran into these even owning the complete games as a child. You put in a cartridge, you put in a disc, you turn the game on, and there's nothing. Yeah. There's no idea of what is going on. Mm -hmm. Star Voyager was just one of those games where, you know what, I, I should look up exactly what I was supposed to do. Because I still feel like that was a game where you wandered around, maybe went into hyperspace, and nothing <laughs> interesting happened. If you've ever wanted to feel the infinite vacuum and emptiness of space, play Star Voyager. Because the last interesting things you hear is when you hit start and you hear... <laughs> which is the sound of your little astronaut guy running to the ship, climbing the ladder, getting in, the viewport closing, and you shoot off into space. And then... It's a whole big I, – I could sit here for the next 45 minutes with my arms up in a shrug because that is my <laughs> lifetime experience with Star Voyager. It's funny. It kind of sounds like the creators of No Man's Sky were didn't play that game and probably should have because then maybe they wouldn't have made the mistakes they've made now. For those who don't know, The Uninitiated, uh, No Man's Sky is a game that pretty much has no story that lauded, oh, you can discover space, but we're not going to tell you what to do, which pretty much made most gamers go, well, then why do anything? I'd rather have something with something. So yes, that, this sounds like the Nintendo version of that game. Yes. It was the Nest Man Sky. <laughs> Nest Man Sky. Good. Good one. Pretty much. Um, I thought uh, a good place to shift the conversation, instead of just uh, recounting every system we've ever played, though we probably could... To shift to more modern gaming, as we're going to talk about that as well, um, and talk about maybe our favorite game we're playing right now and why? Huh. That's actually an interesting one. I tend to leave about six or eight games open at any given time, <laughs> uh, simply because of the fact that I own a lot of systems, and mm -hmm. I'll get into that. And hilariously enough more often than not there's at least one final fantasy game that's going on <laughs> uh whether i've beaten it before or i haven't and i think right now in modern gaming i'm kind of leaving things open because i want to purchase final fantasy 15 and dive <laughs> into it and i don't want to be in the middle of another game i just 
a few weeks ago purchased a PS4. Uh-huh. And I've been a PS Plus subscriber for my Vita for a little while. So I've just been – I knew I was going to get the PS4. So I've been subscribing and getting the free game since I think uh, three or four months ago. Oh, nice. So I'm excited about the Resident Evil remake that I now have for free. Mm-hmm. I'm excited about Transformers Devastation. It was not bad. I liked it. Uh, it was a fun game. I you know, That's the thing. Looking at a lot of these, I've been reading forum stuff, reading reactions where they're like, oh, these aren't great games. They're not AAA titles. PS Plus used to be about AAA titles. You know what? I'm excited about these games. Transformers Devastation, isn't it a... a, Didn't Platinum make the game? So Platinum made that game, yeah. I love that kind of run around, beat everything up, big button combinations, Mm -hmm. big boom, bam. I recognize these characters, how over the top. Especially because it's a style of game that is... Especially when Platinum makes it, it's very aware of itself. Yeah, for sure. It's not trying to be anything that it's not. And I think... That goes very far in gaming. In a lot of different kinds of media, knowing exactly what you are and either leaning hard into it or subverting it or leaning hard into it so you can shock people one Mm -hmm. way or the other. But knowledge of your audience, your style, the trappings and the tropes can be a great help in almost any sort of media. But I feel gaming in particular, because it is one that demands the interaction and experiences and history of those playing it, that sort of self-awareness goes a long way and is wonderful. That's not to say that you could still make a bad game even if you're aware of what it is. Right. But Platinum can make a good run around, beat all the things game. Sure. Um, uh, it's funny that you mentioned Final Fantasy XV because as of when we're recording, I just started playing it. And I really like it so far. Unfortunately, it's a game that requires homework because there was a movie and an animated series that came out before the game, which now that I've watched, I can wholeheartedly recommend that you check out before you play the game. But um, I'm also kind of doing a similar thing with modern gaming. I think it's because just kind of the stress of the time and, and where I am in life at this moment, I need this kind of ability to kind of turn my brain off while gaming. And I love Final Fantasy and I'm actually really enjoying the new game. But it requires you to pay attention, think, and engage in a a narrative, which sometimes I can't be bothered with, um, just because I need my brain to kind of shut off. And so I've also been engaging in World of Warcraft again since Legion was released, um, mostly because they released the class Demon Hunter, which is the class Illidan is in, is, and if you're familiar with the lore of World of Warcraft at all, um, that's a big deal. Um, Illidan is one of my favorite characters from their lore, so I dove back in pretty hard. Um, and so, like, if I need time where I just want to, like, interact in an environment but not think too much, um, I, I'll play some WoW. I'm also trying to catch up on my Steam library, which I always feel is an impossible task. Um, but the the console games that I've been playing also, I've been leaving open. Like, I'm still only halfway through Uncharted 3 and the Ar- Uncharted trilogy because I want to play the fourth one. Um, I still haven't finished Minecraft Story Mode, which I got, which a friend of mine wrote on. Shout out to Laura Jackman. Woo. Um but yeah, I feel like as a, an adult gamer, that's kind of a constant. Whereas as a kid, you're like, you're very quick to blow off everything so you can just play video games. As an adult, you have way more responsibilities. And as anyone with half a brain, you're like, oh, I want to play this thing all day, but I should do other stuff. And then whether you're in the right mood to come back to it or not or whatever. And so I can definitely relate to the leaving a lot of games kind of open to go back to. I'm playing the new Pokemon, Pokemon Moon, which... I'm only in the first couple of hours of because I ran around in circles catching as many Pokemon as I can, Mm. as you do in those games. Absolutely. Well, I'm actually playing Pokemon Sun. Nice. Excellent. So there will be trades in our future. Absolutely. And honestly, a lot of my easy, great uh, modern games that I'm playing now are in the handhelds for those for those very same reasons. While I the way I live my life, I am able to set aside every so often, sometimes more often than others, a big chunk of time whether that's three hours to an entire day Mm -hmm. to sit down and play console games yeah um those are when i just tear through backlogs of games Mm because especially because nowadays a lot of games um certain rpgs and things like that notwithstanding they are designed to be beaten in a couple of hours yeah and so i can sit down and die and die and fail and get better (laughs) and go and and this and that and the other thing you know and take care of that or I find little runs of time. I've actually found, um, you know, when 
you get a lot of uh, like life hacker kind of sites and, you know, find the time in your day and this and that. And yeah, they talk yeah. about um, like meditation and working out and morning rituals. Did you know if you give yourself an extra half hour to 45 minutes while you get ready in the morning to sit down and play a video game that you enjoy or you're playing through – it really does make your day better. That's how I that's how I first played Bioshock. Oh wow. I played an initial chunk where I got to do like two hours or so, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not very good at first person shooter games, <laughs> so it took me a little longer than most people do. But mm-hmm. hey, fun story, great atmosphere. I was really enjoying it. And it was one of the first games on the three sixty that I'd played. Gotcha. But I'd get up a little early in the mornings and I'd play a little more. I'd maybe, you know, save a little sister mm-hmm. or get to the next area. Or find another thing of whatever Cohen wanted me to do. Right. And it was a great way to experience it. But most of my experiences these days are handhelds. Yeah, and, same. And I think some of that is the fact that you and I are, we live in New York City. Yeah. We live in a commuter town and one with public transit. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very comparable to the fact that the Game Boy itself was first designed for a commuter culture, when you think about yeah, it. Yeah, Because Gun- Gunpei Yokoi witnessed a man... Oh, actually, it's the Game & Watch. Gunpei Yokoi witnessed a man playing with the calculator on his watch while sitting on the commuter train going into work. And it's sort of, well, if he's just going to sit there and mindlessly push at these buttons, let's give them something fun to do. Right. And so handhelds came about for that. And I am happy to carry on that tradition as <laughs> I go to work in the morning or to a gig or to anything like that, to have my 3DS with me, to street pass, to you know catch them all. I'm currently on the third island. Oh, nice. Uh, yes. I, yeah, I, I just got to the second island. It's, it's a lot of fun. I've been really enjoying it. And many, many opinions. And I have a long history with Pokemon. Actually, going back to our personal history a little bit, Pokemon was the game that got me into Game Boy. Interesting. Because I had my Game Gear. I loved my Game Gear. I still love my Game Gear. I no longer have it. I love it wherever it is. <laughs> um, my brother had gotten a Game Boy Pocket mm-hmm. and had some fun games and this and that, and Pokemon was coming out. Mm-hmm. And I got to play it in bits and pieces on other kids' Game Boys, and oh my god, <laughs> Pokemon! Uh, you needed it. Yeah. And like, it's so funny to look back literally 20 years yeah literally 20 years and think about a franchise that is an institution yeah uh, that was once considered oh that's just a fad that kids are gonna like from japan and it'll go away yeah like many other fads but here we are and to try to remember that same sense of discovery wonder mystery about this game yeah the realization that a game boy was capable of holding this party that you could catch and move around and they had different moves and the different typings and the massiveness the sheer massiveness of the original red and blue in comparison to what you could do on a handheld at the time felt amazing and so i saved up my money saved up allowance saved up this and that and i bought a game boy pocket Mm-hmm. That was the same color blue as Pokemon Blue. <laughs> um, it was one of those, like, Toys R Us was having a quick sale. I got the, the Game Boy Pocket for 50 bucks because the Game Boy Color is being announced in a couple of weeks, mm-hmm. which is very much kind of my history as a gamer. I get systems, like, in the, in their waning time. That's, that's I've had that problem, too. I bought a GameCube uh, about three weeks before they dropped the price by $50. Ooh. Um, I bought, what was it, the original PlayStation about two weeks before the PlayStation, the PS1 came out. That was the smaller version. Yeah, I have that, that history, too. And it's funny that you mentioned Pokemon because, so my, the game that got me into handheld gaming and Game Boy specifically was Kirby's Adventure. The original Kirby, or Kirby's Dream Dream, Land. Kirby's Dream Land. The original Kirby's Dream Land, I just loved uh, unabashedly. It was simple yet complex. It had, you know, it just had an adorable lead character, which I'm always a sucker for. Kirby still to this day is one of my favorite Nintendo characters of all time. Um, Mine too, actually. And, uh, but I, my memory with Pokemon is a little different because I didn't have a Game Boy when Pokemon came out. I got a Game Boy much later. But my early experiences with gaming was with PC gaming, and a friend of mine had a ROM for Pokemon. And he had a ROM for Pokemon Green, which led me to my favorite Pokemon of all time, which is still Bulbasaur. Always will be one of my favorites, along with Gengar, is my favorite evolved Pokemon. But um, we played it on ROMs, and what the interesting thing about the ROMs were, first of all, they were on 3.5A floppy disks. If you don't know what that is, you're young and I feel old. 
Um, but you, you, what you would do is you would take the, the emulator and your local file, and if you put it on a disk with someone else's emulator and local file and put it in one computer, you could open a, a shard of the game where you could trade with each other and battle with each other. And so we would take these emulators, take our local files home, play and play and play. And the next time we hung out at my friend's house, we would battle each other. And then I found out much later that you could actually do that with a thing called a Game Boy. And so I ended up getting Pokemon Yellow when that came out, because that's around the time when I finally owned a Game Boy. And I loved that game. I was annoyed, though, that Pikachu was the only Pokemon who would walk beside you. I wanted my Bulbasaur out and next to me. And How happy were happened. you when Heart Gold and Soul Silver happened? Yes, much happier. At last. But, um, but speaking to the new Pokemon game uh, briefly, I really enjoy it also. A lot of people complain that they made it a little more accessible. But I think with the success of Pokemon Go, it was inevitable that they were going to add more tutorials. They were going to add more explanations. Because people who have never played Pokemon games before had access to it for free. So now they're going to want to play this new one. And so that doesn't really bother me that much. Um, I think we've gone long enough, though, talking about gaming without actually mentioning what our favorite game of all time is. I have one on deck easy, but I'm curious to see what yours is first because my favorite game of all time has been challenged in recent years, and I'll get into that, but it's still the top contender. So what's your favorite game of all time if you can pick just one? Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Excellent choice. It is. There are other games that will grab my attention or grab my uh, imagination or time more readily every now and again, but as a game that I have sunk countless hours into, countless, my freshman year of college, whenever <laughs> I was sitting talking with friends, I was also hanging out, um, leveling up the Muramasa, which is the bloodthirsty sword. Yep. I would be in the first castle fighting mermen, killing them just over and over again. I maxed out the Muramasa. Like, the, I still have that file. Um as far as a game that I can just play and replay, and I love Symphony of the Night is my, sort of like how Bohemian Rhapsody is my favorite song. Right. It's There are other ones that catch my head, everything else like that, but at the end of the day, Castlevania Symphony of the Night is my favorite game. It's definitely a great choice. It's in my top 10 for sure, but uh, my favorite game of all time goes back to the Super Nintendo, and um, another console that I was late to get into because I bought a Genesis first, but I'm over at my friend's house and I see this game with a cover. There's a monster and a guy jumping with fire on his sword in like a wintry area. And I'm like, what is this game? And so, of course, it was my early introduction to the game Chrono Trigger, which is my favorite game of all time. I've owned every version of it for the PSP, for the Game Boy Advance, for the PS1, for the Super Nintendo. Any version of that game that has come out, I have bought. Um... I loved it. First of all, I grew up a Dragon Ball Z fan, and so the artwork of Akira Toriyama has always been one of my favorite things. And when I recognized him on the cartridges, I, I was like, I, what is this? I want to play it. I sunk so many hours into every version of Chrono Trigger. I think the most hours I put into it was the PS1 version with the new cutscenes and the additional content. Well, with the loading times as well. It oh, certainly just... meant extra time. That was actually the version that they ended up releasing for the Game Boy, uh, the game, uh, the Nintendo, the Nintendo DS. DS. And that one didn't have those loading times, which no. was great. That's the version I have. And so I've sunk so many hours into that game. I've gotten every single ending. I've found every single weapon, beat every single boss. It's just one of those games that I typically hate a silent protagonist, but it was this was a game that defined what the purpose of a silent protagonist is. And it's the, still, to this day, the only RPG I've ever played where the main character, the focal point of the story, can die, and you can still progress and finish the game. And that I've never found before. And I think it's one of the most fascinating things from a storytelling perspective is you have a silent antagonist because silent a... Silent protagonist. A silent protagonist. Sorry. Um, no, that's fine. Um, a silent antagonist would be very different and very confusing probably. That might be a fun thing to explore and I would love to see if there's a game that has that. Right. Um, but um, having Chrono not speak allows you to imprint on him, of course, like every other character like him. But the difference was also when he was removed from the party... It could still kind of feel natural without him, yet you still felt like there was a hole because there was this person that never said anything but definitely drove the story that's now gone. And so it's one of those things that I really just appreciate about that game that it's just a, such a unique experience. Um, and so, yeah, that's my favorite of all time. Um, Mass Effect 2 came close, and Mass Effect 2 is probably my number two or three. 
But uh, Chrono Trigger still, like, every time I go back to it and I watch that opening cutscene, I get butterflies. Like, it's just such a solid RPG. And I would definitely say Chrono Trigger is one of my top ten as well. That's yeah. uh, It's a perennial classic. But it's one that I actually don't have as deep of a historical connection to. Mm. And I think that, too, carries into where people's favorite games are. Sure. There is usually a story behind the discovery. Yeah. You, su- you recognized Akira Toriyama's art. You basically went, who's this ginger Goku-looking motherfucker <laughs> jump- <laughs> jumping that thing? Pretty much. Um, Symphony of the Night, for me, actually, it c- comes with a story. It was an accidental love. Mm-hmm. Uh, my friend Kieran, whom I would love to have on the show one day, Mm-hmm. Uh, who also is the reason why I own a Chrono Trigger box, but not a copy of Chrono Trigger. <laughs> Amongst other things, the man just ha- had this great luck for finding wonderful, strange games when, when they first came out. So he never had to go back and rebuy them, but just happened to have crazy shit. Mm-hmm. But he had a Blood Omen, Legacy of Cain. Mm-hmm. Which is a game that I love. I love the Legacy of Kane series. Oh, I for- me too. I have- Blood Omen Two is still one of my favorite PlayStation games of all time. Fantastic! It's so good. Um, and I just happen to love that l- Blizzard-like melodrama of yeah. a story. And then you just put in vampires and time travel and soul eaters, mm-hmm. and it's my soap opera. It's <laughs> so good. So I I loved it. And again, I like those top-down kind of action RPG Diablo, Diablo Two. Yeah. Um, you know, Crystalis, Legend of Zelda, any of these kinds. And my brother loved it too. And one time, my brother went with my mom to Blockbuster, mm-hmm. uh, get, rent a movie, rent a game. And he couldn't remember the name of the game. He just remembered that it had vampires. Mm-hmm. And we didn't grow up playing the Castlevania games on the NES. Right. I've since gone back and further love. Just um, the series speaks to me. But he came back with Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Because he couldn't remember Blood Omen Legacy of Kane. Right. This is like going, I couldn't remember which Cadillac you liked, <laughs> so I got this Lamborghini. <laughs> Pretty much. And I still love Blood Omen. I, 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 I have my full Legacy of Kane series in my collection. I go back to it. It's fantastic. And really, if you want to have a good, bad voice acting off, <laughs> throw those games at each other. Yeah. Save Victus. Jeez. And that's how I found it. And it became that game of, all right, this is cool. All right, oh my God. Oh my God. And losing my mind over this game. And that became that one that we rented like five, six, seven times before we finally just went and bought the game. When you rent it enough times that you've paid for the game, yeah. just buy the game. Yeah. That's the thing that kids don't have to worry about now because renting is barely a thing anymore. I think Gamefly still exists, but that's about it. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we've lathered on about our gaming past long enough, I think. I, I would like to shift gears a little bit and talk about what this uh, series is going to mostly be about. I think we're going to be deep, dipping into our gaming history throughout the run of the show because we will tie a lot of our experience to history. But essentially, the idea of this is to not be just another game review show or a Let's Play channel or anything of the like. We really want to approach gaming as a medium as an art, as something, essentially the way I, on my other podcast, Crash Chords, approach music as an art and I dissect it and analyze it, but less from a game to game perspective like I do CD to CD there. CDs are these discs, like music comes on, Never mind. Games come on them too. That's true. Um, uh, But I think here we want to kind of just talk about tropes in the medium, how how the medium's growing, you know, talk about console releases and, you know, you know, uh, big news stories and things of the like that are about the community, but as it growing as an art form more so than going, that game was bad, that game was good. I think that kind of podcasting, while it has its place, is not something I think needed needs to be added to. And if we if we want to add to it, we'll do it elsewhere. Right. This here, we want to work with the thesis that People argue and will continue to argue, are games art? Are games uh, life-changing? Are games this, that, something profound? Mm -hmm. What they absolutely are, are here. Mm -hmm. Games exist as a media, as a format, as an interactive existence in its way. That sounds bigger than I meant it to be, but... The fact that just the same as books exist, as music exists, as movies exist, games exist. And electronic gaming, video gaming, has evolved rapidly. And what's funny is we're in an interesting state where certainly over the last decade, 
uh, games have both reached forward and reached backwards and reached laterally. Yeah. And you sort of just the same as you have your big budget blockbuster movies. You also have your independent film festivals. Yeah. And you have student films and you have um, strange experiments of the medium that still occur. And periods of time where in film there were ridiculous ideas of, of uh, film things and more art house ideas. Ones that have limited appeal and yet there is a fervent fan base for it, even if it's 12 people or the like. Games do that. Games are that. And so often people try to go, well, they try to treat games like movies. They try to treat games like books. They try to treat games like TV shows, like anything else. Games are games. And I think what we want to explore here is the culture, history, and future of games in hardware, in software, in design, in designers, and in the historical impact on the people who play it. Yeah, I think it's important to mention like uh, ever since gaming became its 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 own media with its own force, people who played them have been referred to as gamer, a term that I'm hoping will die soon. And I identify as one, but I think the reality is you don't call someone who reads a book a booker. You don't re call someone who uh, watches movies a movier. Yes, there are movie buffs and there, there are, are bookworms, book but it's not the same connotation that gamer had. And so I think that also be with games becoming more accessible, with the success of Pokemon Go, with Nintendo finally having a third-party mobile-only game, these are big changes for gaming as a huge landscape. And I think that there are big changes coming to it. And so approaching the medium and talking about it like this is really important because... I could wax eloquence for probably an entire episode about why Chrono Trigger is the best RPG ever made. And I still hold that claim, and I'm happy to argue it with anybody. Maybe that can go on YouTube. But but that said, I think that a more interesting way to talk about gaming is to talk about its effect on us and the world, both personally and publicly, and even bring other people in who might have their own stories about gaming. I think stories about gaming and expanding knowledge of the medium is more important at this point than just simply reviewing games. Absolutely, and especially because there have been so many games. Yeah. And games have been released so quickly. Gaming landscape has evolved, again, so rapidly in the last 30 years, system to system, generation to generation, that a difference of a few years in when you were born changes the games you grew up with mm -hmm. or where in the country or what country. And the fact is, in nerd culture, and I think the fact that games – are the media more than any other that can be uh, thrown in the nerd culture circle. Uh -huh. um, Non-nerdy people play games and, you know, there are many nerds who don't play games, etc. But you can watch movies and not be considered a nerd or right. at least have to shake that off for a moment. Uh, games, the whole nerd thing, whatever. But you still shake it for a moment. Um, you can't play every single game that yeah. isn't going to happen it's you can try task. it's an impossible task it's hilarious to try and there's some <laughs> great series on things whatever but also coming at it at, from an analytical standpoint as an adult is very different than what you grew up with mm -hmm. the limitations you had and the things you had to overcome or lived with or found and discovered naturally mm -hmm. um those are different experiences they shape us and it's not a place for us to go for me to be angry at Matt for never playing Crystalis <laughs> or him to give me, you know, grief because Chrono Trigger isn't my favorite game of all time. Right. Um it's something to revel in our love of games yeah. and share our history, our experiences, and if that leads somebody to something new, that is something to be celebrated. If that leads to a new connection or idea, that is something to be celebrated and pursued. And more than anything, we want to celebrate gaming Yep. on this show. Yeah, I think that's the big goal, ultimately, is to celebrate gaming. And we appreciate you coming on the ride with us. Um, we have a lot of things planned, but again, we wanted to spend about 40 minutes or so letting you get to know us. So, um, of course, if you have any questions, I'm available on Twitter at Matt underscore Storm. Or on Facebook, you can look me up as Stormageddon or Matt Storm on Facebook. If you have questions concerns you want to suggest stuff for us to chat about please reach out um we'll have more official fun and game stuff as the series continues but um you know thank you for tuning in and we will catch you next time and you can find me on twitter and tumblr and social media and the like at jeff g-e-o-f-f -F, jeff makes noise thank you so much for tuning in everybody we look forward to chatting with you again soon and happy gaming <laughs>